Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. And I'm joined, as always, by Ryan Macon, who is paying through the pain with uh, the cold right now. So uh, it was just, just F- FYI, so I'm, I'm going to do perhaps a little bit more talking than the normal. Um, but it's also a very interesting time in the calendar. I know you had on it as World Economic Forum Week. And I felt that this was a good opportunity to to talk about something that uh, I've talked a little bit about on Twitter. Um, it's a topic that I found interesting over the last year or so. And there's been renewed interest in a variety of different channels in the works of James Burnham, and in particular, the idea of the managerial revolution. And I, I think that the World Economic Forum in particular, while I, I think there is something to be said about how we perhaps overstate the importance of Davos as a physical place and, you know, Carl Schwab and his like really creepy, you know, space outfits and John Kerry talking about how the people there might be extraterrestrials and all that sort of stuff. Well, I, I think it's easy to perhaps overstate the importance of, of that individual room and this individual event. You know, you, you can do all sorts of evil things without getting together. Um, I do think they kind of are a perfect embodiment of larger concerns about global corporate power, about the view of kind of de- decaying direct private property, entrepreneurs guiding society, that increasingly it seems that the political agendas are less dictated by democratically elected officials for all the problems that we know with democracy and more about a rooted bureaucratic class and this is why you've had people interested in the work of James Burnham, because, you know, he was writing you know, during World War II about a new economic system that was going to replace capitalism that had failed. And he was wrong. Right. This is this is Burnham was wrong about this, but that capitalism had failed. We were never going to get back to full employment. We we're going to have you know, endless homelessness unless we adapted that socialism doesn't work. You know, as, as a former Marxist himself, you know, socialism has its own problems. And therefore, all advanced systems are going to adapt this form of third way politics, this this uh, economic managerialism that, you know, was very in vogue in Germany and in uh, Italy and in FDR's America. And that this is a way forward and that ultimately all these other f- forms on the side are going to kind of decay into the oblivion. What's interesting is that reading Burnham's book. A lot of his predictions are absolutely wrong. And his, his absolute, I think, his, his disinterest in economics and instead his very great interest in political power and the sort of Machiavellian project, um, as, as you know, this, this was criticisms that Burnham has received from uh, uh, George Orwell, from our own Justin Raimondo, um, and a, a very interesting article about Burnham's thought. Uh, Murray Rothbard had a review of uh, Sam Francis's Beautiful Losers that touches upon Burnham's failings as well with his connection with Francis. And one of the things I think is interesting and completely missed in this contemporary discussion of this Burnham notion of managerialism, which I think is true now more than when he was writing, is, of course, the financialization of the economy. And so all of this is sort of a wind up into the way that modern central banking, a common theme on this show, um, Ryan, you have a, a great article out this week about you know the, the laughable notion that the Federal Reserve is a bank by, by any you know, real measure of it, but it's a purely political institution. And of course, again, I, I think one of the most important lessons that I would love to see continue to, to trickle out into other circles is the degree to which financialization, uh, which you've written, my, I think, one of my favorite articles on this topic in the past as well. Um, financialization is what has created modern managerialism that has empowered this deep state class. And that if we do not strike at the root of modern central banking and finance, then the Davos crowd um, and everything they represent wins. And so with that, that wind up there, Ryan, take it away. Well, there's so much there that uh, we could talk about. Oh, good. My voice sounds nice and low thanks to this uh, cold. So we'll just continue on this for this week. I just wish it would stay this way for the uh, the future. But alas. But yes, talking about uh, Burnham. I mean, yeah, the I would highly recommend uh, Justin Raimondo's chapter on Burnham from Reclaiming the American Right, one of Raimondo's best books. 
Uh, and yeah, not overly sympathetic toward Burnham at all. It just takes out what what good insights the guy had. Uh, but I think you could learn a lot of the same information by just reading uh, information about state building and the history of the state, which has come out in the last 50 years or so, probably. You could learn a lot from, say, Martin Van Creveld in his Rise and Decline of the State. This talks about how managerial institutions, the bureaucracy, basically took over our notions of what government should be uh, in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, so that's like the larger historical context there. But uh, I think it's the 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 way I had suggested this episode to you a little bit was in in the in lo- in line with the idea of here we've got the central banks, they're pumping out money. They're since the 1980s when financialization uh, took on a uh, a whole new dimension and became much much larger and much more dominating in the economy. Uh, Central banks have become the key financial institution, especially in the last 20 years. And so what you see over and over again are Wall Street hacks and media and basically everyone talking about how what's going to happen in the economy. Well, it just depends on what the Fed does next. Well, that's not normal in a in an actual economy that has, you know, markets and such then what happens next in the economy depends a little bit, (laughs) if not mostly, on what's going on in terms of production and income and wages and efficiency, not just how much money will the Fed pump out next month. But that's where we are now. And so the way I sold the episode to you was, hey, let's talk about how we're going to hear all about how all this capitalism in the world is ruining the economy and how there's just too much capitalism right now, and how when the economy fails, we're going to hear about how uh, capitalism screwed us over, when we could just look out there and we can see right now that the Fed has bought up about 23% of all mortgage loans. So you got almost a quarter of the entire mortgage market in the Fed portfolio. That's, That's not what a market is. That's not a functioning market. Central banks have come to so dominate everything that it's just the latest reminder of how you've got these technocratic organizations run by these Davos type people, which is absolutely who's running the Fed. And you've got, as we're seeing at Davos, all of these organizations, these quote unquote private organizations, in league with these government officials. There's so little separation between. Uh, the the so-called capitalist elite and the government elite. It's not the 17th century when the entrepreneurs and the capitalists were this hated group that was on the outside and the people who ran everything were the nobility and the monarchs. And then the capitalists were fighting to get some independence and representation and they were separate from the ruling class. Everything's very, very different now. And of course, then there's no real market functioning in any of these economies right now where the central bank has completely taken over. So yeah, when we're looking out there and we're seeing what's what's going on right now, the the age we're living in is the third way age, as you're talking about, right? It's what a lot of the critics, um, well, it's, it's what we could call neoliberalism. Now, when a lot of critics of neoliberalism whine about neolib- neoliberalism, what they really mean is all liberalism. They mean anything that's like markets. So they equate neoliberalism with libertarianism, even though they also include Hillary Clinton among the neoliberals. I mean, the word is so broad as to have no meaning. But when people who hate neoliberalism from the left talk about neoliberalism, they're just talking about, hey, there's too much capitalism. But the reality is, is that if you think of neoliberalism as this thing that's occurred since World War II, where we can't let laissez-faire happen, we've got to regulate it, we've got to have big welfare states, which is the reality because it's not real liberalism, then that's where we are. You can talk about how capitalism failed. So has every other ideology except neoliberalism, right? Monarchism failed. Conservatism failed. Classical liberalism failed. Communism failed. Where are we now? Everything, every regime wants its own brand of this third rail or not third rail, third type of market organization. 
And that's this whole highly interventionist state. It's the intervention Mises talked about because he always made a distinguish. He always distinguished between communism, socialism, and then just interventionism, which he didn't like either, of course, and pointed out that it just gradually leads more and more to socialism. But that's where we are. Every, if you look at the global elites, that's what they all want. They want something that's not communism so that they can continue to be in control of their own little pieces of it. Uh, but they certainly don't want laissez-faire because that would mean real competition and real freedom. And that's unacceptable to this elite as well. So that's where we are. That's the ascendant ideology. That's the world we live in. And so I'm getting a little sick of hearing about how capitalism and laissez-faire is out there running rampant, destroying everything. And of course, the problem is, is that the, the figureheads that we see as being the great titans of our modern age, right, are, are the benis, biggest benefactors of it. And it, it's, it becomes a very depressing dynamic where, you know, Jamie Dimon, who is by all means, you know, not, not, not exactly one of our, our, our favorite people for a variety of reasons, but like it's, it's him uh, standing up to some brain dead congresswoman from uh, I think Minnesota, Minnesota, I believe, um, railing against how, you know, their sort of energy policies and their desire to force banks to not invest within energy projects is going to, you know, create hell on earth, I think is might have been his, his literal words there. It's been a while since I've seen the clip. And it's like, if, if Jamie Dimon is as good of a is, is the best spokesperson we have out there, um, you know, trying to push back against some of this stuff, then, then that, that's, that's a really bad sign, right? I mean, Elon Musk, even with with all of his quirky um, you know, recent stuff and his Twitter accusation, you know, his, his Twitter acquirement and, you know, the, the Twitter files and all that sort of stuff. I mean, here's a man who has built his entire career largely based off of benefiting from government subsidies. And, and itself, I, I think this is one, if, if we look at the auto industry, it, it perhaps I think is a, is a very concrete example of how this form of managerialism truly works because they've, they, they've built into the market so many incentives promoting a particular market in electric vehicles. They did it by subsidizing Tesla. They, they've done it by um, uh, hurting with, with regulations on emissions and things like that. You, you've had it happen both from uh, Washington bureaucracy as well as even you know, far more progressive policies from a state like California that carries with it a tremendous amount of economic weight. And so the, the dynamic to which profit and loss guides the way that, you know, it guides, a, it steers a market, it steers what is produced. They have done a wonderful job of so manipulating the factors that go into that profit and loss dynamic. Again, you are a winner if you're a consumer buying electric vehicle. You are a loser if you buy a vehicle. And that's not even getting into the taxes on gasoline and all of the, the energy dynamic there and, and the way that, you know, we have made it harder to create uh, uh, gas processing facilities that, you know, diminish our America's ability to, you know, fully utilize its own oil reserves and et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's so many finger, you know, so much weight skewed on both sides of this equation that it has created a signal for so many other car companies to rush into the specific market, this particular, this specific idea is following Elon Musk. Um, and, and I, I do like that fact, uh, I, the Toyota CEO, you know, has this comment and they're, they're avoiding that marketplace because they think that there's nothing wise there. I don't know. You know maybe, maybe they're the Japanese really are smarter than the West. Um, and, and their ability to figure that out. But so again, if, if Elon is the punky, you know, guy is trying to stand for the right thing, we don't have those sort of titans of industry that are willing to speak out with a confident voice to highlight what is going on. I mean, back in the day, you know, some of the biggest benefactors for Ludwig von Mises, for Leonard Reed, you know, for the, the libertarian aspect of the old right in particular were General Motors. Right. It, it was major manufacturing and all that and the way that they've been able to the, the regime has been able to so co-opt this class with, with perhaps the occasional, you know, the, the occasional example. Right. I, I know John Mackey from Whole Foods goes around to the Students for Liberty events and, you know, that, that's great. Right. Fine. 
Um, you know, the Koch brothers, you know, historically played that role in their own sort of ways, you know, plenty of criticism there uh, on, from, from certain people. But, you know, fine, they they made a big part of their uh, uh, industrial mission, promoting, you know, free markets and, and you know, the name Louis von Mises and whatever. Fine. But that that class is dying off and, and very much in that process. And so that leaves you who defends capitalism if the biggest economic benefactors that represent industry are all completely co-opted by this economy that the, 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 this, this financialized managerial revolution has created. And I think that is creating a lot of the angst and the frustration that you're seeing kind of percolate politically on the right, that they're, they're taking a, a more uh, a business skeptic and, and perhaps more appropriately corporate skeptic viewpoint. I, I think often they are right on this. But the, the problem is, is that if you're not grounding these critiques back into an appreciation of sound economic theory, right, if, if your only focus is, you know, Berno Machiavellian politics, then you are missing a massive piece of this equation because ultimately, you know, if, if you own the libs and, and you succeed, you still have to figure out how to create and produce stuff so that your society doesn't decay and, and, and destroy itself. And, and that, that is the aspect here where, you know, how do you promote the importance of industry if all of the great figureheads of industry are completely co-opted? And like that's, that's, that I think is, is something that makes that World Economic Forum sort of dynamic so, so scary to people. Because again, you know, once upon a time, not that long ago, you know, own, owning, a, you know owning a computer you know, was, was really cool. And the internet embodied everything great about society and all this, all this age of advancement. And now, you know, Bill Gates is viewed as a, as, you know, and I think rightfully so, like I'm, I'm not defending Bill Gates, but you know, now if Bill Gates has become, you know, one of the comic book villains of the modern age, you know, it, it, I, I can understand why it kind of forces you to re rethink everything. Yeah. I mean, who are these uh, great saviors of freedom? The people at Twitter, people at Facebook, I mean, come on, <laughs> they, these people, uh, not only, yeah, sometimes they were strong armed by the FBI, but they willingly assisted the regime with uh, spying on people, censoring people, silencing people. Uh, they pushed back a little bit, but come on, these, these people, uh, they all grew up in the same sorts of places. A lot of the time, if they all went to Ivy league together, they all think alike, uh, the only people who are really out there who are defending freedom are generally the outsiders. And it's it's because once you've reached the apex of industry, normally most sectors of the industry, not all, there are some areas that don't benefit heavily from uh, government subsidy and intervention. The closer you get to financial sector stuff, real estate, banking, Wall Street, the more government intervention there's going to be because states for 500 years have figured out that one of the first industries you take over is the financial sector. So they've been meddling in that for centuries. Um, so anytime you hear a banker talk about the b bankers, right? They're, they're they're happy to accept boatloads of government subsidies. They're subsidized to the tune of trillions of dollars now through the interest paid on reserves by the central bank, heavily subsidized by the taxpayers, not to mention the fact that they uh, benefit first from a lot of the newly created money. And ne let's never forget TARP and those low interest loans they got that the bankers ridiculous. OK, well, oh, we paid all the, the TARP money back. Yeah, you would have gone out of business without the TARP money. You should have been bankrupted and liquidated. The only reason you still have a job, Mr. CEO, is because you got that uh, taxpayer subsidized loan. And then so, of course, they're living off the sweat of the taxpayer, these bankers. And then they every time there's some regulation they don't like. They turn around and whine about how, you know, we need to protect free market economics. I mean, give me a break. They don't care anything about that. They're just trying to protect their own particular shop. And if if they can build their uh, uh, their portfolio through government favors, so be it. And that's, of course, the electrical automobile thing. Being an entrepreneur now 
is figuring out ways to get government money. It's figuring out ways to screw the taxpayer. That's what entrepreneurship is among this, this elite of people who are involved in electric cars, in the financial sector for the most part. Yeah, there are always people on the outside. There are people who are trying to create new products and compete who are not favored by the regime. And those are the people you probably have to look to. And I think maybe that's why 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we looked at people like Jeff Bezos and we looked at people like Bill Gates and we thought, hey, these are scrappy little entrepreneur types. They're uh, they're doing something different. Maybe the future will be all these entrepreneurs controlling the internet and they're going to be these laissez-faire types and it's going to be great. What people forget is that the regime has boatloads of money and it could easily co-opt the brightest people, the smartest people, and and get them to work for the regime and do what the regime says. So your only the only way out of that is you need people who are extremely suspicious of the regime in large numbers. And uh, that's certainly not the case at the moment. Uh, you would need to change things so that you you had something going on like in the 19th century where you had more of a mass movement of where people hated the regime. But that was because they learned to hate those institutions like the monarchists, like the uh, people who were involved in mercantilism, right? But that's where we're back to. We're back to a sort of mercantilism, mercantilism, whatever you want to call it, where the state has figured out to co-opt whatever markets exist – to turn these people into servants of the larger regime and then to use them to actually empower the regime. It's not a new strategy. It was perfected really in uh, the 17th and 18th century, uh, but it's certainly back. The 19th century had a great run for some more laissez-faire. The mercantilists came roaring back. They seized control of that. And so when you see the World Economic Forum meeting it's just the it's just the mercantilist 2023 all getting together to figure out how they can work together to empower the regime and themselves. And so, yeah, we can't just when these conservatives, they trash industry, they trash uh, the markets. They don't really understand uh, that they're not really trashing markets. They're trashing people who have been co-opted by the regime. They're usually uh, they don't have much interest in how markets work or how capital works, so they can't even really tell the difference between a new entrepreneur who builds up a large, successful business and someone who's living off subsidies from the government. That's very hard for them to understand a lot of the time. And so they don't make that important distinction. There's the productive class and there's the parasite class. And the conservatives don't make that distinction properly. There's just industry, and then there's people who uh, want to live like farmers on the open land, like it's the 13th century or something. They have this romantic view of how everybody should be living, when the reality of the distinction that matters from classical liberal exploitation theory, which the Marxists then ripped off and created this idea that people are exploited by the capitalists, the reality is the exploitation is simply one of people allied with the regime, who use regulation and taxes to rip off the productive classes. So those are the two classes you need to worry about, productive and parasite. And some people involved in industry are parasites, some are not. Everyone involved in government's parasite, and they're in league with a lot of the people involved in quote-unquote private business. And so that's what you need to be on the lookout for. That's the difference between a good entrepreneur and a bad entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, some some libertarians, some classical liberals are the only people who are really properly making that distinction right now. But that's what we have to look out for, because you cannot just look out and say, oh, this person's uh, they're head of a private business. They must be some lover of capitalism. Uh, so many private businesses. Heck, their only client a lot of the time is the government. Think of uh, these construction firms that build roads or uh, government owned uh uh, sewage treatment plants, right? They don't have a single private sector customer. Uh, think of uh, that horrible company that makes like voting machines, right? Which which is now suing for uh, being uh, uh, being defamed, right? They're basically a government agency. And then all these private uh, weapons firms, or Eric Prince with his uh, mercenary firm. We're we're supposed to act like these people are are princes of capitalism. They've they've never made an honest buck in decades because they're all living off taxpayer funds. So we do need to have a more sophisticated view of what the markets are and just how much of it's also de being financialized by central banks. That is by the regime, and that uh, you you need to just be uh, more discerning and what's 
what's laissez-faire, what's not, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys? Because the way it is right now, people are getting it very, very wrong. And of course, something that doesn't help on this, and this is going to sound like a, almost a, a left-wing criticism here, and I, I, I think those that know me well enough know that's not the case. But uh, you, you do have a dynamic there where you, if you look at the list, like the 25 richest Americans, you notice a lot of similar last names, right? You, you, there's a lot of those that are the, the biggest benefactors of these large corporate enterprises that were not the people that founded them. So you, you have, uh, there's, there's another aspect here where, again, this, this ties into another aspect of this, which is the, the takeover of elite institutions where, you know, the, the sons and grandsons or, or granddaughters of these, these great titans, um, you know, have, have, they're in a position to enjoy the, the fruits of their, you know, what they've inherited and yet can then utilize that in all sorts of, you know, ways that go completely against all the values that their superior uh, predecessors had. Um, I know Curtis Yarvin likes to highlight, um, you know, the complete decay of the Ford family and how you go from Henry Ford to the Ford Foundation and everything that they finance. Um, I, my, uh, my wife and I have been enjoying, uh, we were watching a series, The Food That Made America, which um, highlights all of these great sort of uh, uh, industrial age food titans and you know how they solve these problems of people moving from like small town farms to these these very tightly condensed cities and all of the problem solving the innovation that you had to come about to like how to feed all these sort of things and and it is worth noting that back in the day like you you did have the sons or or in in one case uh, i know the, the post family the daughter um was very innovative in their own right and, and helped you know build what was already a successful company into something even you know, far greater than what they inherited. So this this is, an, I think, a historical, you know, a, a historical absolute that the next generation must be worse than that that came before. But but that, that's another dynamic here. And when you combine that with the financial incentives, in particular of that post two thousand eight era, where those that are in financial markets benefit so much more than those without it, you know, how many new, you know, how many people that have the, the talent and the mentality to have succeeded in becoming one of those great titans of, of, of disrupting an industry, creating that, uh, that, that creative destruction um, that yeah, I, I'll always have to be careful throwing around, you know, Sean Peter references and Austrian podcasts, I know, but, you know, how many people that, that might have otherwise been able to have that ability in other eras have had a, a, a far harder deck stacked against them because of just the incredible power of, you know, again, the, the, the extent to which modern financial policy has rewarded those previously wealthy and so skewed the markets in ways to drive completely political outcomes. And of course, this this is what leads to broader concerns, right? When When we think about the manipulation of, you know, food, of health outcomes, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the way that housing policy, I mean, now, now you have banks, you know, saying that they're, they're not going to make mortgages. I think it was Wells Fargo or someone, uh, I mean, a pretty major player in the market saying that they're not, that they're, they're going to make mortgage uh, decisions based purely off of skin color and things like that. I mean, you have some of the most uh, a profound, important sort of needs that society has that is now being filtered through a purely ideological ends that can then result in very material ex environments that can fundamentally alter the way that people think going forward, um, that can have incredible uh, consequences to family structure and production down the road. Um, this kind of you know, that, that kind of touches into you know the, the, the consequences of how you know in debt uh, millennials and Generation Z has been, per, you know, in particular from the student loan scam and the way that helps fuel people you know not getting married or, or having kids later and later in life, which again tends to influence political views of individuals. Um, you know, it, it is it's a very very scary time. And again, the important thing is that for those that have appropriately realized. You know what time it is to use a, a popular Twitter phrase. The the issue here is not, you know, the 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 victories of libertarian economics 
and you know the right worshiping at the altar of the market it, it is entirely that the managerial revolution that burnham was in, in, in his case celebrating has come true through financial markets and again unless we deal with that dynamic then you know any facade any attempt to fight it without taking that into into account is is you know, you're, you're not hitting the actual problem there yeah and you can see just how much they depend on all of that of course it's never a surprise to see a company like wells fargo doing exactly what the regime would like to see. They're always in lockstep with the regime in terms of whatever the latest political fad is. And why wouldn't they be when you've got not only the Fed buying up nearly a quarter of all mortgage-backed securities and thus bought through that, taking worthless mortgage loans and propping them up by just holding them on the books forever and not selling them, uh, and buying them with newly printed money, which you pay for in terms of inflation, so that's a, just a, basically a indirect subsidy to the whole banking sector right there, the whole real estate sector. And so you wouldn't want to upset the, the monster that controls that sort of thing. Not to mention the fact that, uh, of course, big financial institutions also have sizable bond portfolios a lot of the time. And the uh, Fed has also bought up huge portions of of government debt as well in order to keep interest rates low on that so that the government can just keep up with deficit spending and not have to uh, to deal with what in a normal market would result in an inevitable rise in interest rates. So it's got its fingers deeply in there. And of course, then banks, they don't want to, they don't want to upset the apple cart. And so it's all of these cultural issues, culture war stuff is actually being funded indirectly by the regime because by buying up so much of what's important to the private sector, they just have to do whatever it is that the regime wants to do. And it's really no different than from the East India Company or these other government corporations in the 18th century that tended to be in lockstep with the monarch, right? What he wanted, that's what you did, because that's how you got your special favors uh, in order to carry out your, in order to enrich yourselves as the people who headed up the East India Company. Um, and so they were, they're just two, two sides of the same coin. And that's what's going on now. You should view um, these companies in the same way that an American revolutionary would have viewed uh, a, a government, a, a monarch-backed corporate entity in 1775. It's, it's the same sort of relationship. They're extensions of the crown, if you will. J.P. Morgan is. And that's the amount of uh, moral legitimacy you should give them in terms of respecting them and in terms of seeing them as something distinct from the regime. The only way out of that then is to starve the beast. Uh, you you got to stop buying into this idea that uh, the government should be able to print all the money it needs, that deficit spending is no big deal, because all they're doing is financing your oppression by, by propping up all these companies that can then just do uh, whatever it is the government wants in terms of enacting social policy, cutting you off if if you say something that the company doesn't like in social media, all of that would be impossible, really, without just these constant subsidies coming out of the federal government, because companies would have to actually compete for customers to treat their customers right. They would have razor thin profit margins. It would be much more competitive and it would be much more open to new entrepreneurs coming into the marketplace to serve underserved groups. But as it is, everything's just fine because we fully financialized the economy. And what does that mean? I mean, we keep throwing that term around. What it means is that the central government through a variety of mechanisms, and there is an article that we'll link to uh, in the description on this, where they have essentially shifted the balance away from physically productive firms. So by offering risk-free, essentially, financial uh, investments and by making it more so that moving money around, that lending money, that buying up government debt or other types of debt is more lucrative thanks to central bank intervention and regulation, then putting that same money and investing it into, say, an automobile factory or a pharmaceutical factory 
or something that builds things, or say a trucking company uh, that's good for logistics. Any of those things that that work in the physical world, that move around things, that build real things, that employ large numbers of people, those have all become relatively less profitable because thanks to the central bank where all the real action is, where all the real money is, is in the financial sector because they'll bail you out. They'll ensure that risk is low by buying up assets uh, to increase its value. Um, and anytime that the financial sector looks like it's in trouble, here comes the central bank riding to the rescue. Other parts of the economy, they might just be let go out of business. They might be forced to actually exist in a competitive marketplace, whereas we all know that the more deeply embedded you are in the financial sector, the more likely you are to get special favors. And so that just shows how screwed up the economy is because now building things is relatively less profitable. What is profitable is just parking, billionaires parking their money in certain places that are likely to get bailouts. And uh, of course that's simplifying to, to a significant extent, but that's essentially what has been going on for the last 35, 40 years. And that's what we mean by financialization. I do have a, a note from legal that when you say that these companies are like, well, we should view them the same way the revolutionaries viewed uh, British corporations. We are not advocating people breaking into ports <laughs> and throwing bug burgers into the sea. Just, you just want to make bug that very clear. Burgers. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think we need a, a little bit of, of a, a end on an uplifting note. And because this is, a, this is a lot of doom and gloom on where we are now, but this is what makes this current environment so interesting um, where you're, we're now dealing with James Bullard, um, you know, one of the members of the Fed earlier today um, said that he looks at, um, he, he's viewing interest rates in 2023 going up, you know, well beyond 5%, um, you know, continuing the, the, the gradual increase in rates, um, you know, going against the, the pivot narrative out there. Um, he has been right in the past, but, you know, any Fed official has, you, know, you go back long enough and they, they, they will be wrong. Um, I, I am interested in this dynamic. We, we talked earlier at the start of the episode, the degree to which past Fed policy has fueled all of these problems. And yet there, there does seem to be something of a tension between what the Fed is doing and what the rest of the world wants the Fed to do. Um, and at Tom Nwongo, um, who's, who's always interesting, or always a, a very in interesting pundit out there. Um, Gold Guns and Goats, I believe, is his blog. Um, but he, he does a lot of very interesting stuff on, on financial and, and geopolitics and things like that. His sort of framing of current events right now is that there's very much a tension between, let's call it the New York crowd and the Davos crowd, and that um, that going forward like that, that that the euro and the ecb you know is 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 not very happy in particular with what the fed is doing and that other economic powers out there be them central banks dealing with the real cost of rising interest rates and the the governments that they have subsidized um they do not have quite the same strength that america has for a variety of reasons and that ultimately we might see more of a break between yeah you know, after, after um you know a decade plus of relatively, you know, hand in hand central bank policy and the consequences thereof. Other countries, if Powell continues to increase rates, um, and, and I, I know we, we, we have, and I think continue to be skeptical of, again, we're not trying to, to, to certainly paint, you know, lawyer Jay Powell as, as some sort of great heroic figure, but if, if they really do prioritize lowering interest rates to the degree that they have voiced in the past and have so far followed through with policy, it will be interesting to see how that breaks away with some of the fact, you know, some of the folks that attend Davos and the World Economic Forum, because ultimately this very financialized, politicized economy needs the fuel of artificial low interest rates to help make up for the real profit and loss consequences of making products that people don't want until they are perhaps engineered to want. That, that is a larger process. That is a longer process right there. Um, so that's, that's, that's a dynamic that looking forward, 
know, does a pivot from what has been a long, gross, um, it, it, hedonistic monetary uh, financial framework does a with the potential of a sustained new era. We'll see if that happens. But does what, what, what impact does that have on the problems that we are discussing right now? Well, I think that everybody loves the Fed, of course, when the Fed's inflating, right? Hey, everything's great. The Fed, it's keeping the, the, the money spigot going. It's great. The Fed is a perfect genius organization run by brilliant people. We love them. There's nothing wrong with them. That's what Wall Street always says when uh, the Fed is inflating. That's what other governments always say when the Fed is inflating. Uh, but as we have tried to emphasize here at the Mises Institute, and we'll get it, we got to keep doing it more because people still aren't figuring it out, especially Wall Street. The problem is the boom, not the bust, because the problems were all being created when the Fed was just inflating everything, because that's what was causing all this money to flow into BS enterprises that <laughs> like... Like uh, all of these marketing employees, these legions of marketing employees at Twitter who couldn't ever manage to create an actually profitable company beyond a couple of quarters. These people, they were making money to do nothing. And that was only uh, made possible by all the inflation. So people feel great when the money supply is being inflated by the central bank. But suddenly they're all criticizing the central bank when it takes a hawkish turn. And of course, I use that in relative terms. I mean, I wouldn't describe the Fed as hawkish per se, but relatively so, obviously, compared to the days of Janet Yellen. And now everyone's complaining about the Fed. Uh, but what's important to keep in mind is that the Fed, uh, it, I think in particular, Jay Powell, I think he's smart enough to recognize that inflation can actually get out of hand and that they don't know enough to know what could happen if they just let things fly. And so I think he's trying to err on the side of caution. Now, why would he? Everybody, everybody wants him to spend more money. Well, wouldn't that make him popular? Well, if there's any rule in politics that you might be able to point to historically, it's that high inflation leads to political instability. And the, the job of regimes is to avoid political instability. They hate instability. We hear about how bad instability is all the time in a variety of contexts, whether in this country or other countries, and that you need to avoid that. And I think that's what Jay Powell understands and what the smarter people within the regime understand. And that's why they, at least in the minority probably, are pushing uh, rising interest rates because they want to actually kill the inflation dragon, not because they love the American people, not because they think inflation is bad based on some sort of uh, economic theory, but because they recognize that it leads to political instability. And so that's that's bad news for all the other central banks that are deeply wedded to easy Fed money or for other governments that depend a lot on Fed uh uh, inflation and and invest American investment in their own in foreign worthless bonds and that sort of thing that's enabled by easy money in America because the Fed is able to essentially export its own monetary inflation because uh, other central banks ride on that phenomenon. So everybody's real mad about it. Also, they don't like a strong dollar, you know, quote unquote strong, just relatively strong compared to these other currencies. We saw it after Volcker's time. When only a couple of years after Volcker finished uh, creating a relatively strong dollar then, all these other governments started whining about that and, and called America to the table at the, to uh, hammer out the Plaza Accord so that the dollar would start being devalued again through the central bank because uh, they didn't want uh, a strong dollar because that then makes it harder for you to buy American goods and uh, also American exporters don't like that. And it makes life more expensive for certain groups. So they want a weak dollar, even though many people, of course, benefit from a strong dollar. So we should, of course, expect to see lots of whining and complaining uh, from other regimes and from Wall Street about a, uh, a relatively strong dollar and rising interest rates. But the, the problems that they're now encountering from a rising interest rate uh, wouldn't exist if we hadn't had 20 plus years of easy money and rock bottom interest rates that then reached just ridiculously low levels, essentially negative real rates 
after 2008. And then that lasted for what, 13 years? So that should have never happened in the first place. That is what made life so easy for all these Wall Street people who didn't actually have to be particularly productive but could just keep selling more and more and just betting that there'd be some bigger sucker to buy this stuff and that interest rates would never go up. And they made boatloads of money. But now they're seeing that in a rising interest rate environment, they might actually have to work for a living, and they hate that idea. So they hate the Fed all of a sudden, even though the Fed was their hero for the decade before that. And this is all just becomes because they lack the Austrian understanding of the boom and bust relationship. And so we shouldn't expect them, of course, to come to a good understanding anytime soon. Uh, but I think what's important to keep in mind is that this is the the, the trade-off, the, the choice that has to be made. Is we are, are is the Fed going to buckle from the pressure on those sides, from Europe, from Wall Street, to then start inflating again so that we could get a second round of inflation as what happened in the 70s? Because that's what kept happening in the 70s was, oh, we tightened the money supply slightly. It looked like inflation was going to go down a little bit. So then we went back to our old inflationary ways. And then we got another larger wave of inflation. Powell has made multiple comments saying he doesn't want that to happen. And of course, you can only trust so much what these people are saying, but I think that's a reasonable conclusion for him to come to, and he, so he may actually understand it. And again, he's not doing it because he's a great humanitarian. He's doing it because the regime is actually afraid of high inflation levels. And so it's, it's a matter of thinking short-term versus long-term. If you don't think long-term, you might end up with runaway galloping inflation, and that leads to things like coups. Uh, we, can, we can tie multiple military coups and other sorts of um, actions that overthrew a regime due to inflation because it leads to major problems for people to be able to afford a living. And so if I were them, I'd be afraid of runaway inflation too. Uh, so it seems that the Fed uh, is, is for now trying to walk some sort of, of road where they avoid runaway inflation, but they also don't create too much of a recession, which lots of, we can talk about this next time. Uh, so much data now says we're in recession right now. I'll be shocked if a year from now, we're not talking about the early 2023, late 2022 recession. Um, but they're trying to create something that's uh, that's a soft landing, whatever that means. But they're not going to just go back unless something changes in terms of internal pressure because they are really afraid of uh, runaway inflation. And the reality is revolutions still happen, that regimes get overthrown, that people riot in the streets. This stuff still happens, and it happens in places where inflation uh, gets away from the ability of the regime to control it. And so they're right to be afraid if that's actually what's motivating them right now. Well, in particular, when you add the geopolitical tensions out there, Saudi Arabia recently mentioning that they're open to trading in currencies other than the U.S. dollar. I'm, I'm always skeptical when I hear these headlines, you know, it's just like, the, you know, hearing for years about, oh, well, China's going to create a gold base you want any day now. Don't, don't you worry. That's what's going to take down the dollar. I, I have a d degree of skepticism of that because of how bad everyone else is. Right. You know, our, our, our problems are not unique to us, but particularly in that sort of environment, though, the, the, the dollar being the cleanest shirt in the laundry becomes even more important in a in, in sort of the, the chaos of the current global environment as well. So that's that's definitely uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, but that being said, I, I think I'm going to let you get out of here, Ryan, and get back to your uh, recuperation. Um, but uh, this has been Radio Rothbard. Again, remember, we will not eat the bugs. We will not live in the pods. And because of that, we will see you next week. Oh, good. My voice sounds nice and low.